in this service to have this thing up here so you guys can hear me. Apparently I did not do a very good job. Yeah, Lonnie's running now. <laughs> I'll try to keep it there, Lonnie. Thank you, son. So I got a little scattered here this morning trying to keep things together. Uh, before I forget, so I was asked to remind everybody, I know Gary talked about it. Um, there is the 12 gallons of milk or 13 gallons of milk that are over here. Um, please help yourself to that. Um, if anybody is wanting to be notified when the, the food trucks and stuff come, uh, Gay Castelo has been kind of the one that has been heading that up. Uh, if you need her number, contact Pastor Cody. And we can do that. As Gary said, we're not allowed to put it out on social media. But I know that whatever day it was this week, April said there was like 300 and some gallons of milk that came in. Uh, and they was not expected that day. And trying to get that out without it getting spoiled. So praise the Lord, all but 12 gallons of it has been given away. So uh, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, when I was up here about five weeks ago, five weeks, five months ago, it feels like five weeks ago, um, I talked about confirmation. Uh, whenever I do anything, I always want to have God's confirmation that I'm doing His work and that it's not what I feel is something that needs to be said. Because it's really hard sometimes to define that difference between what you want to talk about and what God's telling you to talk about. Uh, and the last time I had it a couple of weeks before I got up here, and last week, all the way up until Friday, I had no confirmation, and I was getting nervous because I was afraid God was going to wake me up at 2 a.m. on Sunday with something totally different and have to put it together. Uh, but Friday night, we watched a movie that's called Greater, and this is a football-based movie, but it's based on a true story of a young man who had zero athletic abilities for football. But because of hard work, his faith in God, and God leading him on a journey, he followed through. He went on and got, ended up getting a full ride scholarship through uh, Arkansas and then became, was supposed to go on and play for the NFL before he was killed in a car crash. But the verses that were used in that movie in a specific point in time were exactly what we're going to talk about today. And that was my confirmation. And so it was really awesome because I sat there watching the movie and I, I'm the crybaby of the family. And I just started crying. And Aaron's looking at me like, Dad, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, nothing, buddy. You won't understand. And he's like, looking at me like, there's just something wrong with Daddy. And I was. Because when you're overcome by the Holy Spirit and you have that, it is hard not to be emotional that way. So if you guys get an opportunity, uh, I'm not getting an endorsement for this, but the movie Greater <laughs> is a really awesome movie to watch. Um, you guys, I can tell, have been awake a little bit longer than everybody in the first service was. Your all's coffee has had opportunities to kick in because you're all a little bit more lively than they were. Uh, I got up this morning and, and sat outside on the front porch, watched the sun come up, drinking my coffee, reading the, the Bible and uh, praying, uh, praying that God didn't let me forget everything that I had here for you today. Um, but as we open up in a word of prayer here, uh, two things I want. One, I want to read you some scripture that God laid on my heart this morning. And it says, I will, um, excuse me, it's out of Isaiah 61, uh, 10 and 11. It says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be exalted in my God, for he has clothed me in the garments of salvation. He has covered me in the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress and a bride adorns herself with jewels. This morning, God is adorning us with his righteousness and his robe. As we go into prayer, I want to uh, give a special prayer, and I didn't do this earlier for my mom. Uh, when I preached five months ago, mom had fallen and uh, was in a rehab facility. A few weeks ago, she fell, cracked a hip, and broke her wrist. Now, I'm not sure what she's going to do the next time I preach to get out of coming to see me. But I want to keep her and lift her up on our prayers, so she's going to pretty good extenses for it. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come to you this morning, 
with all joking aside, with humble hearts, with heads bowed. Lord, I pray that the message I have today is your words. And Lord, I just pray that our hearts and our minds are open to that message. And I pray, Lord, that as we go from here today that we do your work and that we seek your will, Lord, and that through all of this, your light shines through us that others may see you, not us. They'll see the physical side of us, Lord, but we pray that they see you and the difference that we have. Lord, I just pray for mom and her healing. And I pray, Lord, that she gets better and is back to full strength. And that one day, Lord, she can again grace the doors of the church and worship with your people. Lord, I just ask and pray things in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. All right, since we're going back to school, Heather asked for prayer for going back to school. It's pop quiz time. So for those of you who weren't good with pop quizzes, sorry. Five months ago, does anybody remember what I preached about? (laughs) The target, the bullseye, right? Leaving a legacy for God. You guys are awesome. So... For you guys, I've got a free cup of coffee or bottled water out here when you leave. (laughs) Absolutely, I do what I can. That's what my budget allows me to do today. So (laughs) So today we're going to start in uh, Hebrews, and then we're going to go to 2 Timothy. So, Mr. Woody, in Hebrews chapter 12, if you all want to turn there with me, we're going to read verses 1 and 2. And then from there, we're going to go into 2 Timothy chapter 4. So in verses 1 to it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, it says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teacher to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober minded, endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry, run your race. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Who can tell me who wrote that? Paul. Paul. Nice job. He fought, he's, he's getting practice back for going to school. So this was written at the end of Paul's race. Why did Paul run the race? Did he run the race for his glory? No. Whose glory did he run it for? God's glory. Was Paul always running the race for God? No. He was a persecutor of God and God's people. Why do we run the race for God. Do we run the race for our own glory or do we run for God's glory? Sometimes it's a fine line and you can step one side or the other very easily. Is it a shiny gold medal that we're going to get? Is it when we cross the finish line, do we get a gold medal? Do we get to stand up on the box? Yeah, stand there for that. 
How many of you guys have seen the Judge Judy commercial where she says, shiny, 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 right? That's what I'm going for. Isn't that what you guys are going for? The shiny thing at the end? A crown. Oh. No. So in James 2, verse 26, it says, For as the body without the spirit of dead, faith without work is dead also. So today we're going to talk about running the race for God. And we're going to be talking about being on Team Jesus. Because when you're on Team Jesus, you can't help but do work for God. Right? But sometimes there are people that I've talked to that tell me, when I ask them if they know Jesus Christ, they're like, yeah, I know who he is. Yeah, yeah, it's good. I'm like, okay. But there's a difference between knowing who Jesus Christ is and accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, right? Because Satan himself knows Jesus Christ personally. Now, I've talked with Jesus Christ in my prayers. I've had dreams with him. But I have never stood face to face. Even Satan has done that. So it's not just knowing him and doing something, right? You've got to be there. So how do we run the race? Is there a sign-up sheet out in the foyer? Did our deacons put a sign-up sheet out there so that we could be on God's team? No. You have to get on Team Jesus. So the first thing you've got to do is you have to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you don't start there, then what we're talking about right there, all of your works are for nothing. And starting on Team Jesus means you have to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. In John 14, 6, it says, Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. No matter what you do, no matter how good of a person you are, no matter how fast you can run, or all the money that you can donate for a charity, if you're not accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, He tells you, you cannot go to the Father but through me. So when you've accepted Jesus Christ, now you're on the team. Woohoo! I did it! There's an awesome feeling when you have the Holy Spirit come into you for the first time and you accept Jesus Christ. Is that true? A couple of you got it. It's an amazing feeling, right? So now what do we do? Do we just get to kick back on the sidelines? I made the team. Look at me, Mom. Selfie. No. When you're in team sports, what do you do once you make the team? Yeah, it's the coast to put you in, right? But you got to earn that, right? So you got to train. Mr. Woody? Now, do we train like Rocky Balboa? You get the top of the stairs. Woohoo! Eye of the tiger. Ah, you did it. Do we train physically? Sometimes. Because sometimes God sends you places where you need to have physical strength and endurance. But the true training that we need to have, Mr. Woody, is training in God's Word. Reading the Bible. Prayer. Every day. Now I'm here to tell you, and I said this when I preached last time, that sometimes the things God lays on my heart are because I need this more than anybody else. Spending daily time in God's Word. Spending time every day in prayer. Understanding what God's Word is. Learning. Practicing. Because what happens when your faith is tested? Somebody comes up and starts asking you questions. You need to have the knowledge for it, right? To get put in, for coach to put you in, you've got to prove that you can do it. And sometimes they just throw you in there because you don't stop asking. And then you get in there and you realize, maybe I don't know quite as much as I thought I did. And you start with the basics. So it's been said many times that the sport of baseball is extremely simple. You catch the ball, you throw the ball, you hit the ball. 
What else is there, right? Those are the basics. And so when a player is in a slump and they're having problems, what do the coaches always tell them to do? Go back to the basics. Preparation. God's Word. Prayer. Quiet time. Blocking out all the rest of it. Do your training. Does your training ever stop? Do you ever stop practicing? No. Terry, have you ever stopped practicing? No. He hasn't. He's looking at me like, what? But he hasn't stopped practicing. No matter how old you Dave, have you ever stopped practicing? You buffet your body? <laughs> that is a good word. In Philippians 4.13, it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Christ's power through us. What was our monthly prayer? Power, right? His power in us, not mine. Because I can tell you that it still scares me to get up here. I get worried that I'm not going to say the right thing or I'm not going to have the right stuff. And and I pray that everything that I say is from Him and for His glory. Our race is going to be long, hopefully. I'm praying that I'm able to run a long race for Christ. So along with having our Bible having our prayer, we have this here, our church, our fellow believers. So part of what you need to have is a group of people also that help hold you accountable, that you can go to and talk to about what you need to do. Because the coach, God, is going to give you that instruction, but sometimes understanding that instruction is difficult to do. I sometimes struggle with what I read in the Bible. And so I go to people and I get wisdom from them. People who have already been there. People have already walked through that path. When we get involved in church, getting people involved in what interests them, right? So we have a multitude of people here and everybody is different. We may have similar things, but we're totally different. We have people who are builders, mentors, teachers, preachers, and my personal favorite, the cooks. Because I was raised in a Southern Baptist church and we fellowshiped over food all the time. And some of the greatest bonding and learning and lessons you can have are during that time. Amen? Dave and Connie know about that. So now that you've gotten on Team Jesus, you've done some practicing, you're ready to go, your coach put me in. It's time to run your race. And sometimes when you first start out, it's easy peasy because you're on that high from Jesus Christ when you've accepted him. Just like when kids get on a sugar high, there is nothing that can go wrong for them until they crash, right? And that's what it's like when Jesus first gets a hold of you. You're out there and like, this is easy. This is going to be great. I can do this. But be careful, because in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourself it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So remembering that what you're doing is for Jesus Christ. It's not for yourself. It's not for, look at me, I'm standing up here, I'm, I'm preaching today. Look at me. I've got my fancy tie on. No, it's not about me. You're going to see me, but I pray that you hear God's words. You see His works through me, just as most everybody here that I know is the same way. They pray that your, God's works are seen through what they do. But then all of a sudden, sometimes, you're going to hit some roadblocks and detours on your race. Now, sometimes, Satan will hit you with one of those big, hard, bolder detours. And our faith is shaken to the core. 
and you take a detour. Sometimes that detour is a little longer than expected. Sometimes you may even leave the church for a while because of something that's happened. You may question about what you thought you knew is truly real. And in those times, you need to go back to the basics. God's Word, prayer, and fellow members of the church. And we as fellow members need to recognize, too, when somebody takes one of those hard detours and follow up with them to help bring them back. Because I can tell you from personal experience that that detour can be a long, hard road if you let it be. But then there's also times when it's little things, right? Little things that get us busy because Satan really doesn't have to do big, huge things to make us have a detour. He's just happy if oh, I'm tired and I don't want to go to church on Sunday. I'm going to kick back on the river of life. How many of you guys have ever been floating before on a river? When you're out on the river, it's peaceful, it's quiet, you don't have a worry in the world. And that's what Satan would be just happy if you do. Kick back on the river of life, throw in a fishing pole and a cold Pepsi in your hand. Just cruising. No worries. Yeah, don't worry about church. Don't worry about your job. Don't worry about this, because there are things out there that will get you entangled in, right? You can always spend another hour at work. You can always spend more time working on your property or on the farm or doing something instead of stopping and taking the time that we're supposed to. So remembering our training and going back to it on a daily basis. Now during the time when you race, when you guys run a sport, when you're part of football, baseball, basketball, it doesn't matter, during certain times you have ceremonies. And those ceremonies are important to build you up, to give you some confidence in what you're doing, right? So when you accept Jesus Christ, you get on the team, one of the first ceremonies is what? What is it? I heard somebody whisper it. Baptism, right? That is an amazing ceremony. We're commanded by God to do it, but it's an awesome ceremony that lets people know, hey, this is my public profession of faith. I have been washed white as snow. And throughout your time, there will be other times when this will happen. For me, right now, being part of the men's ministry, working with our youth group, I get rewards in that all the time. It's not always standing up here getting a shiny medal or anything else. Sometimes it is just a hug from a child that is one of the greatest rewards that I get. And it's amazing, that feeling that I have for that. Now, as you grow, you're going to go from being the new guy on the team to a seasoned veteran. And your position on Team Jesus is going to change some. You may go from working your way up to the starting quarterback to becoming a coach and a mentor. When my grandmother was alive, about six months before she passed away, she'd gotten to a point where she couldn't drive anymore. She couldn't get out. She couldn't leave her home without somebody taking her. And we were having a conversation one day, and she said, I don't know why God just doesn't take me. I can't do anything. And I told her, I said, Grandma, I said, as long as you have breath, God has purpose for you. I said, you are just not able to do what you think you want to do. I said, you have knowledge. You have spent years in the church. You have an opportunity to mentor, to talk to people, to do that. And she got that opportunity. She had a whole library full of stuff that she donated to the church, and she started to get a little more involved with what she could for talking to people at church, being a coach for them. 
She also led a young man who was doing yard work at her house to the Lord. So until your last breath is done, even though your race may change, you're still in the race. But what are we running for? The other way, sir. There we go. Are we running for the medal? All right, so we stand at the end. I stand at the gates of heaven and I get a medal. Is that what I get? Do I get that shiny, shiny, shiny? I do. I get to go to heaven, right? So do you realize we get our prizes sometimes here? Grace, mercy, the knowledge that we have eternal life through salvation. And that one day, one day I will get to see Jesus face to face. And my ultimate reward will be eternal life in heaven. Because he has promised us that. He has also told us that right now he is in heaven preparing a place for us, for me, for you, for you. Everyone is having a place prepared for him that is a believer in Jesus Christ. Now, I know most people, and I don't either. When I'm here on earth, I'm not thinking about what my ultimate reward is in heaven. My focus is more on making sure I'm running the race properly for God. And I get that detour all the time. And I make mistakes all the time. And that little navigation thing is going, redirecting, redirecting, redirecting. Yeah, I'll make a U-turn. Because sometimes you know it just wants to slap me on the back of the head and say, dummy, get back on course. But our ultimate reward is heaven. In Hebrews 11, chapters 24 through 26 say, By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater than all the richer riches in the treasures of Egypt. For he looked to the greater reward. He knew that all the riches in Egypt could not compare to the greater reward of eternity with God. And 2 Timothy 4.8 says, henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all those who have loved him. Every one of you will have a crown of righteousness, a new set of clothes, and a new home in heaven for your race that you run for Jesus Christ. So what are we doing for him? Are we sitting on the sidelines waiting for coach to put us in? Are we in the race doing the best that we can? When my time comes, I want this body to be used up, ragged out, and sliding into home plate for God. And I've got a long ways to go before it gets to that point. But I'm willing to run the race for him. Get on the team. Do your daily training. Run the race and expect the greater reward. All right. So you guys get something a little bit extra special here today that the first service didn't get. So we talked a moment ago about ceremonies. And I have a ceremony I'd like to do today. Sometimes along the race you have some divining moments. And you need certain ceremonies to let you know that you are running the race. 
and that you're doing the right thing. So for the last three years, Aaron and I have attended father and son adventures. Eric has been there with his son, and Brian Schmidt has been there with his sons. This year, we couldn't go because of COVID. It's normally a Friday night through Sunday at noon, and it's all about bonding with your son, spending time with them. It's about getting to know them and being challenged as a father to lead your sons in a walk for Christ. And it is an amazing weekend. But the culmination of it is a ceremony that is done on Saturday. So this morning, I am going to invite all of you to be part of this ceremony. Now, I want to give a special thanks to the men of Relevant Practical Ministries, Tom Cheshire and Tom Gensler, because I reached out to them and asked for their help in this. The ceremony that we have is around praising our sons and giving them a dog tag. Now, this dog tag says, Father and Adventures 2020. This is a meaning of being part of something greater. And in the words of Tom Gensler, who is an Army veteran, dog tags are earned and never given. It is something honorary to have, and for those of you who are veterans, know that. I would imagine that most veterans that I know still have their dog tags because it's a symbol of something that they did, something that they're proud of. So, Aaron, would you please come join me? He has no idea this was going on, so... <laughs> So for those of you who don't know, this is my son, Aaron. And it's pretty hard not to know Aaron in this church, in this community. Because uh, like his father, he has the gift of gab, and he knows no strangers. As, we were, as I have been learning, uh, Robert Lewis wrote a book, and he defines what a real man is. And he says a real man is four things. A real man rejects passivity accepts responsibility, leads courageously, and expects the greater reward. And I thought that tied in very well with what we talked about today with running God's race. So I'm going to do the best I can here without uh, becoming the ball bag that I normally do. So I had to write this down today. So Aaron, you are my son. I am very proud of you. You have a wonderful heart for God. And you let his light shine through you in all that you do. You have a giving heart and a love for Jesus Christ. And you have no reservations about telling people when they are not doing something right, even to your dad. And sometimes that's needed. And I want you to know that I am very proud of you and proud that you are my son. And in the words of Jesus Christ, when he said, this is my son who I am well pleased. Aaron is my son, and I am very pleased in him. I love you, buddy. All right. Now I'm good. In Proverbs 22, 1, it says, A good name is more desired than great riches. Favor is better than silver and gold. I know that his name is written in the book of life because he has accepted Christ as his personal Savior. And in Matthew three seventeen, as I said, My beloved Son, who I am well pleased. I love you, Aaron. We all bow your heads to close in a word of prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you, Lord, that you have given me the opportunity to be here today to bring your message, Lord. 
I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of uplifting my son, that he knows he is on the right race. And I pray, Lord, that everyone here today is on your team, Team Jesus. And Lord, if there's one who does not know you, I pray, Lord, that they have the strength that it takes to step up and to ask so that they can be on your team, Lord. Lord, I thank you and praise you for this amazing day that you have given us, Lord. Amen.